Welcome to Finance in 5. Today's episode is part two of our look at Michael Burry's current stock portfolio. There are a few more investments to cover, including Maxar and Michael's, but first, Quavo, 125,000 shares, $10.08 million. This was a previous holding. This one doesn't appear to be a reopening play to me, but rather a leverage bet on a name that he liked. It's a telecom equipment firm, and it has rebounded dramatically off the lows. And so you need to you need to find special situations. It's it's how I've invested from the beginning. I'm always I've. I'm, look, I'm looking for these special situations, these unique ideas. Quavo's technology is lining up with major growth markets. It might be separating itself from the pack of competitors, mainly because of 5G and connecting through groundbreaking technology. Two fundamentals are about to change the world. Fast speeds and low latency. Peak data rates for 5G base stations are impressive at 20 gigabytes per second downlink and 10 gigabytes per second uplink per mobile base station. Depending on how you structure it. But more commonly, individual users will experience more realistic download speeds of 100 megabytes per second and upload speeds of 50 megabytes per second, which is still fast. The next thing is the latency. The latency is the time that it takes data to travel from one point to another. It should be about four milliseconds in ideal circumstances and about one millisecond for use cases that demand the utmost speed. Think about the paradigm shift. Remote surgeries or safe long distance control of chemical facilities, for instance. Unlike previous electronic communication, 5G optimizes its use through employing three different spectrum bands, which are low speed, medium speed, and one high speed, called millimeter wave. Another feature of 5G solves the lack of frequency channel capacity. The technology divided into three spectrum bands opens opportunities for a huge number of devices to connect with a single base station. The Internet of Things, the connecting of large numbers of devices, shifts the world. Hundreds or thousands of tiny sensors might be installed for monitoring human health, our workplaces, our home, or more. We haven't yet imagined the full breadth. Some people say it's too invasive, but it's huge in numbers. Growth is likely going to occur for a very long period of time. Quavo is at the cutting edge of that. Quavo produces a wide array of products for both mobile devices and base station support. Its products are key parts of the communications implementations, including past networks, 4G, and the coming 5G. The company also sells state-of-the-art products for defense systems, including radar and other applications, mobile devices, cellular base stations, defense and aerospace, Wi-Fi customer premises equipment, smart home and automotive connectivity. Supporting all the markets requires the company to develop a long list of product types. Filters, duplexers, switches, multi-mode, multi-band power amplifiers, and more. The company also noted the importance of and creation of a combined chip with 4G and 5G functionality. Quavo seems to be strengthening its offering for products, bringing in-house a custom designer targeted at defense and space applications. So this company seems to have a lot of upside potential, and Burry has spotted that and wants in. Michaels, 3.25 million shares, $5.265 million. Michaels, far from being a shop that Burry bought just because it shares his first name, sells craft supplies and is likely to benefit from additional purchases recently as parents try to entertain their children stuck at home. Michaels has seen its stock drop 90% over the past few years. E-commerce only accounts for 5% of sales and management has not invested in online opportunities that other retailers are pursuing. But management needs to show substantial changes for there to be long-term betterment in the stock price. The Michaels companies operates Michaels Arts and Crafts stores in the USA and Canada. Michaels retail model rains discount offers on to customers to get them repeatedly coming back into stores. Typically, this is 40% discount offer on one product. What happens though, is that savvy repeat customers will have their 40% discount ready and they will make more store visits to use the coupons. Michaels is hopeful that somebody is gonna use a 40% coupon on one product, and while in store, they're gonna buy another product for full price, and that's how they're gonna make their money. It's often the first to make seasonal rotations of products. I'm not sure when Halloween products first appear on the shelves. It's only with a slight exaggeration that you might start looking for such items any day now. Crafters and artisans are gonna need a lead time so that what they make is available for the actual holiday. A lot of the product brands being sold are Michaels' own 
in-house brands. The company app is probably quite easy to use according to many reviewers to find products and to actually get the discounts applied on them. There's plenty of variety and selection of products and the checkout system is ahead of the competition. The issue however, even though the stores have got a wide range of products, is that they're not responding as well as they could be doing to a competition. Walmart and Dollar Tree and Amazon. It depends really on the product whether or not Michaels or Walmart is cheaper after applying the Michaels 40% discount. Unfortunately the stock price has been declining steadily for years. The following chart shows a five year trend where the stock price has gone from over $28 per share to $8 in early 2020 to about $3 at the end of April in 2020 in the midst of the coronavirus recession. It's hard to see where Michaels can actually cut costs. The annual report notes nearly the entire store workforce is part time. The breakdown of employees countrywide is 32,000 part-time store employees, 8,000 full-time store employees, 4,000 full-time admin support distribution center employees. Michaels has got 1,274 stores, which give it roughly six full-time employees per store. The employee churn rate is high. Management has already reduced costs by converting to a part-time workforce, which leaves little opportunity for major cost savings in this area. Management said that online sales account for only 5% of revenue, which seems very poor. By comparison, Nordstrom has got one third of its sales from online e-commerce. Clothing, according to many people, would seem like a harder sell online due to personal fit, as opposed to arts and crafts products. Michael's management admitted in an earnings call earlier this year that Michael's is late to the e-commerce game. Being late could now mean Amazon is not leaving room for Michael's in the online marketplace. Being late makes it less likely for online to remain a significant growth opportunity. Michael's has an affiliate program where it pays others to refer business and the company only has to pay a commission after a sale has been made, but it only pays 3%. Amazon's default rate is 28%. If you were getting paid to refer customers and sales, I would have thought that it would be a no brainer to focus on a business paying 25% more than what you pay. It seems like a major miss on Michaels' part where it could be offering a much higher commission rate than Amazon and getting bloggers to promote it instead of Amazon. Even better, no actual physical store would be required. Online orders can be shipped straight from the distribution centers. If the company was really serious about improving its e-commerce performance and e-commerce offering, then it could open a website to third-party sellers like Amazon, Walmart, and Macy's, just like those players have successfully done. Despite all of this, the company still has generated cash, it's been able to pay down debt, and it's spent money on stock repurchases. Is there pent-up demand to be released when all stores reopen and customers are financially in better shape? Possibly. There is opinion that there's going to be a post-coronavirus bounce, and the company has not said how many stores have been ordered to be closed. It's going to be hard as well to wean customers off heavy discounts. Other stores have tried that with disastrous effect. Maybe Burry is just going to play this one for the bounce up and do an activist investors play and sell it after the price recovers to say six or eight dollars and make a profit. But it means probably in the long term the stock is unlikely to rise above that eight dollar level seen at around the beginning of 2020. Maxar, 900,000 shares, $9.6 million. Maxar Technologies is a space technology company headquartered in Westminster, Colorado, United States, specializing in manufacturing communication, earth observation, radar, and on-orbit servicing satellites, satellite products, and related services. Maxar underwent a breakthrough towards the end of last year. The game changer occurred on the 30th of December when Maxar signed a deal to sell its division of MDA to a private equity fund for 1 billion Canadian dollars paid in cash. This was a big achievement by the management team and the deal was expected to close sometime in the second quarter of 2020 with the usual completion hurdles to cross, antitrust and other regulatory matters. Then came the COVID-19 crisis, which caused the market to worry that this transforming deal would fail to close. It wasn't a baseless concern because other corporate sales to private equity firms are currently falling by the wayside. But Maxar handled the concern directly. It issued a press release saying that the deal would not be impacted by the COVID-19 situation, which sounds good, but then the market collapsed thinking that it was being sold a dummy. A few weeks later though, the deal completed ahead of schedule on the agreed terms. Nice work by the Maxar team. The key catalyst for a step up in the stock is proof that the vertically integrated business model can work, specifically that the company can successfully build a new Legion class remote sensing satellites and have them launched, put in orbit and made operational. 
it's hardly guaranteed that that will happen. There's plenty that's new to the SSL spacecraft, and as a result, plenty of operational risk. There was news on that front last week. The company announced that it was working live with Raytheon, which is a company helping it to complete the build of the spacecraft. Raytheon provides componentry. And further, that the launch slots have been booked with SpaceX in 2021. As we understand it, booking launch slots in this busy time for the space industry requires a cash deposit. So we would assume that Maxar has placed a cash deposit for its launches, which means that the whole Legion project just got a lot more serious. In other words, it's all looking a lot more likely to happen than was actually the case a year ago. So this is fairly big news given that last time the company made a statement of intent that the MDA sale is going to happen via a press release. The intent did come to pass. So I would be inclined to believe that the company is telling the truth this time around as well. If the Legion satellites get in orbit in 2021 and get on orbit in 2021 and start performing to specification in 2021, then I would expect that to be a big catalyst for the stock. I wouldn't expect that the market's factoring that in at this point in time, however. So essentially, you can buy this stock right now for just over $17, which is about the same price that it was at in December 2018 before the sale of a billion dollars was announced. There's also a more speculative prize on the horizon. The Canadian satellite telecoms company Telesat, one of the larger Canadian state retirement systems, is due to procure a fleet of low Earth orbit communication satellites for a new constant installation that it plans to launch. Maxar, again, is rumoured to be competing for this contract. Were Maxar to secure the business, that would be great news for the stock and would lead Maxar's team to sell the low-margin SSL unit and focus Maxar on its recurring revenue, high-value sales divisions. In short, this is a company where the fundamentals are getting better by the month, but where the stock price is still priced as if the company were circling the abyss, so there's cause for optimism. One interesting thing that has happened recently, which I touched on in a previous video, is that Scion Capital made transactions in firms where a stake exceeding 5% was involved, and those filings were in respect of GameStop and Taylor Brands. Scion filed two separate 13D forms on GameStop. The first was February to early April, where they were buying shares at prices between $2.79 and $4.23, which I covered in a previous video. Subsequently, in May, they filed an additional 13D, showing the sale of GameStop shares between $5.30 and $5.70. They also filed a 13D showing sales of Taylor brand stock at prices ranging from $1.23 to $1.48. Those sales are looking smart right now as Taylor Brands' price is hovering around the $1 mark, but they also represent a significant loss for Burry as he bought the stock at considerably higher prices. However, I have mentioned that it may be the case that his profits or price appreciation from Jack in the Box compensates to a degree from that, as well as the price appreciation from the GameStop. Taylor Brands as well is an interesting one. The company might be one of the largest victims of COVID-19. They are in the process of developing a bespoke online buying platform. However, Taylor Brands are a mall-based retailer at a time when shopping malls have all closed. But even after they reopen, large events requiring formal wear are likely to be cancelled for at least the medium term. For example, high school and college graduations and weddings must account for a significant portion of formal wear demand. And those events are pretty much all cancelled for 2020. Maybe some weddings will go ahead at the back end of the year, but for the most part, they've been cancelled. That, combined with all of their debt, puts the company in a pretty weak position, sadly, one which would have been virtually impossible to foresee back in January. So to conclude, Michael Burry is one of the few people who predicted and profited from the mortgage meltdown in the global financial crisis. While I never suggest cloning even the best investors without doing your research, his track record suggests that what he's buying right now is a good place to start if you're looking for new ideas. You can get some pretty good deals. And I've done some of that too. Another interesting thing is that the Saudi Arabia Public Investment Fund is also positioned in Facebook and Boeing. It's recently announced purchases in those shares as visible on these filings. So Boeing isn't the only high profile investor putting his money into these companies. When this all plays out, well, I'll be running so much money and I'll be able to swoop in and, and buy some of these things really cheap. It might be a bit of a stretch to imagine Saudi Arabia would invest in Las Vegas Sands or Wynn Resorts, given that they're gambling companies essentially and strict Sharia law is in operation in the kingdom. I hope that his fund will continue publicly to file their positions. Oh, I, I don't want to disclose that, but it's a significant amount. What? Toodaloo, motherfucker! Hey, you, you 
hope that you've enjoyed this presentation. If you found value, it would be appreciated tremendously if you could gently tap the like button. If you want to subscribe, that would be wonderful too. Feel free to drop any suggestions about video topics that you would like. And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. All the very best.